Well, good morning. My name is Garland Tackett. I am the pastor of spiritual formation here at Redeemer. And uh, this morning, it marks the eighth week in a 14-week series we are doing called Walking the Way, where we're trying to explore the way of Jesus and trying to figure out how does His way become our practice. Last week, Adam preached on fasting, and in case you missed that sermon or any of the sermons in the series, I would encourage you to go to RedeemerTulsa.org and, uh, and check that out. Adam and Dave and Leanne are all out of town, that's why you got me, and uh, they're out of town this weekend in Cincinnati, Ohio at our annual ECC meeting. It's always good for our senior leadership to get in touch with some of the other pastors in our denomination. But another big reason is that the, they're going is to celebrate Leanne's completion of her ordination into the ECC, and there's a picture of that up on, up on the screen. I just want to remind you, too, that uh, we have a weekly devotional that's connected to this series. We printed a thousand copies of these. I kind of did a head count this morning. Seems like we've had a little bit under 200 out in the lobby. And you may be thinking, hey, it's week eight. I can't jump into this, and that's not true at all. I would encourage you to pick it up. You, you can also download it. Uh, this year is the first year that we made it available to be downloaded like onto your Kindle reader or something like that. So I encourage you. That is at uh, RedeemerTulsa.org forward slash walking the way. I just want a couple of things to point out before we turn to our text this morning. As we've been discussing these spiritual practices, remember that they are not an end unto themselves. If we do that, we basically are turning them into another form of legalism, another form of self-righteousness from our own actions. But secondly, let's be honest, uh, there's a lot of these practices. And a valid question to ask is, am I supposed to be doing all of these? And the answer is no. Let me give you a little bit of grace. The answer is no. I would encourage you to look to these practices that come, that you're drawn to. I want to give you an example, journaling. My wife is pretty good at journaling. She likes to write, and, and she has things. And, and, and Anyway, she's good at that. I've tried it and tried it and tried it. And I tell you, I get into it, and about three weeks later, I realize I had a made signal entry. And so I'm not really drawn to I feel like I'm supposed to be drawn to journaling, but I'm just not. So the point of the matter is, is we're trying to, the six practices that we give in the devotional, and even the, the well, the, the 12 practices that we talk about on Sunday morning, they're there just to kind of to test drive them, but to see which ones you are drawn to. But we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the purpose of spiritual practices? The purpose of spiritual practices is to open ourselves up to a deeper encounter with God. Instead of a superficial relationship, we're moving to a more intimate, more interior relationship. Have you ever had the feeling that you're skimming over the surface of the depths of your life. With consistent practices, our eyes are open to new areas of our own heart, but also open to how and what we hear from God. Our heart receives the love of God, and in turn, we pour out the love of God to our neighbor. This is holiness. This is the fruit of the Spirit made manifest in our lives. So, with that in mind, let's turn to our attention to our text this morning. It comes from Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence with us here this morning. Jesus, our brother, you walked among us. You taught us and showed us how to walk the way. Holy Spirit, you are ever working in and through our minds and hearts. Father, Son, and Spirit, have mercy on us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. This morning, we're going to explore the spiritual practice of secrecy. Over the past few weeks, I've discussed this topic with friends and staff members, and I pretty much get the same inquisitive facial expression and something along the lines of, 
I didn't know that was a practice. This passage that we have read is short, but there's so much packed into it. I'm going to divide our remaining time into three segments. First off, there is a plain spoken meaning to this passage. In fact, I would venture to guess that even as I was reading it, you got it. You understand. I believe it's found in the passage, you must not be like the hypocrites. We're going to talk about that a bit. Next, I want to spend some time in the latter half of the passage with the phrase, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now that phrase is a little bit confusing. What is Jesus trying to teach us? And finally, as we have done in all the preceding Sundays, we're going to have a corporate practice that is directly tied to this idea of secrecy. So with that roadmap in, in mind, let's dive in. This passage comes from Matthew 6. The three chapters of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are often called the Sermon on the Mount. The entire section ends with a pretty incredible statement. It says, he who hears these words of mine, that is the, the preceding three chapters, he who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house upon a rock. But these three chapters have some incredible statements, such as, blessed are the meek, and everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery. Or how about, love your enemies, and you cannot serve God and money. Here's a relevant one, do not be anxious. And finally, judge not. Again, our passage is included in the Sermon on the Mount. Our passage is part of the he who hears these things and does them instructions. Jesus says you must not be like the hypocrites, and he gives three examples of hypocritical practices. These practices are very much like the ones that we're doing in this 14-week series. They are giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. The message is straightforward. Don't be showy. Don't do the things for recognition from people, because if you do, you will get your reward. Adam talked about this last week. We don't fast and let everyone know that we're fasting just to prove how pious we are. Honestly, this is easy, right? Nobody loves a bragger. Nobody wants to be that person who just talks on and on about themselves. Just be here. Here's the rules. Be humble. Don't draw attention to yourself. And when somebody pays you a compliment, you say, oh, you're so kind, it's too generous. Uh, it's really not that big of a deal. So it's easy, right? No, no, it's not easy. We have learned the appropriate social graces that keep us from drawing attention to ourselves. But the fact of the matter is we are experts at hiding our hurt feelings when we don't get the recognition we think we have earned or deserved. We've also earned uh, the skill of m mentioning our achievements in passing conversations. Name dropping would be a good example of this. As always, Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter our interior life, our motivations. It's why he says everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is always probing deeper into the heart, into the soul, into what is under the surface. So here's a question I'd like you to ask yourself this morning. What do you do to impress others of your devotion to God? I'd like to give you a couple examples from my life. I'm pulling back the curtain here a little bit, and um, even in telling you this, I am hesitant. And why? Uh, because I want you to like me. And you might not. Anyway, well, anyway, here we, here we go. Sometimes when I sing in church, I like to harmonize. And part of that reason is probably my Southern Baptist background and the hymnal, and I sang in the youth choir, and I can't read a lick of music. But... I, you know, I can figure, if I know the song, I can figure out how to harmonize. It's no big deal, but if I'm honest with myself, I do it to impress the people around me. That's kind of ugly. Another example is that I'll be in a conversation with a group of people, and someone will mention a particular author that I respect and admire, and I'm quick to say, I agree with that guy, I, I like that guy too. And basically what I'm just wanting is the people in the group to know that I identify with him. He's smart, so I'm smart. He's morally good, so I'm morally good. He's a good Christian, I'm a good Christian. 
in both of these examples, do you see how on the outside, they can seem like an acceptable thing to do, but on the inside, I'm just searching for the approval from other people. I should be relying on God's love, but instead, I'm con- I've convinced myself that the acceptance from people, that that acceptance from people is a substitute for acceptance from God, where in fact, God has fully accepted me. He has been loving me long before I was even aware of his acceptance of me. The practice of secrecy is an action to counter this lie of where I receive my acceptance. I see the spiritual practice of secrecy as a two-step process. First, we must examine our motives. Really reflect on why do we do the things that we do to project a particular image to others. And the second step is basically to do nothing. It's to keep your mouth shut. Maybe for me, the practice of secrecy is not to harmonize because evidently, I just can't do it for the sake of art. I have to do it because I want other people to accept me. I would like to give you a cue that has helped me. I've learned this recently. I wish I had learned it at a much earlier age. It's called WAIT, W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? Such a great question. Why am I talking? What is it about this conversation that I am currently in where I feel like I need to add something? I tend to be one of those people, I'm just waiting for your mouth to stop moving so I can jump in there. Why am I talking? Am I trying to impress? Am I trying to defend myself? That's a great area where secrecy, I need to, that's, I got to defend myself. But why am I talking? Such a good question to ask. And I want to pivot to the second verse in our passage and from this morning and focus a bit more on the phrase, your father who sees in secret. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you a question. What is your picture of God? What's your picture of God? Do you think if we polled everyone, we would have all, the, all of us would have the same answer? I doubt it. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Say it again, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Our image of God depends on how we were raised, and for, the, for most of us, what we learned or didn't learn from our parents as a child. It's not uncommon for people to draw a connection between, between their earthly father and their heavenly father. And so just for a moment, I ask you to think about the God of your childhood. What were you taught by your parents? What were you taught by preachers or volunteers in the children's department? Think about it. Often these connections are in our subconscious. We're not aware of them because they've been with us from such a very early age. I have found that there are, there there can be many, but there are four that I'd like to bring to your attention this morning different images of God. One, I call the drill sergeant God. This is one that's just waiting us for, to step out of line before he whaps us. The next one is a distant or indifferent God. He exists, but he really isn't interested in the details of my life. He put things into motion, and then he took his hands off the wheel. He took his hands off the steering, and, and it's, you know, we don't know how it's going to end up, but uh, well, we'll, we'll see. He's distant. He's diff- indifferent. How about the chronically disappointed God? I will tell you, I I come across this image quite a bit. We just can't ever seem to get it right. Every time we mess up, God just rolls his eyes at us in his disappointment. How about the final one, the busy CEO? He is to be respected, but he's not to be underestimated, and he's got a lot on his plate. This last one really resonates with me. The God of my childhood expected you to dress nice for church, to sit up straight, to behave, be quiet. Because God was looking down at me and he was watching every single moment. He did not put up with nonsense and silliness. Jesus was my friend, but God the Father was to be respected and feared. He was also distant. He was somewhere off in heaven looking down, but he had a lot on his plate. My day-to-day was not that important because he had really big problems he was dealing with. With this in mind, how do you think my mind and heart read this verse? 
But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. How do I hear that? If my picture of God is of a, of a CEO, distant, has a lot on his plate, how does that God hear my prayers? Well, it's a God who's really busy. I need to get these requests made quickly so he can get back to doing more important things. And I better not be bringing him anything that's a waste of his time and just might appear as being ungrateful for all he's done for me. I think he's in a meeting at the moment solving world hunger. We're not quite sure when he'll be available. At least that's what the receptionist told me. And what if I have a chronically disappointed God? If a person has that image of God, how would they hear that verse? Well, that God is good for a serious eye roll when he sees us coming. He might say something, oh, it's you again. It's you again. Let me guess. We're going to talk about that thing that we've been talking about for the last 20 years. But you know what we're not talking about? We're not talking about that thing you did last week. You thought you hid it from me, didn't you? Uh, I saw it. When are you going to get your act together? How we read this verse is directly tied to our image of God. Does that verse scare you? Your father who sees in secret? I'm here to tell you this morning that if your image of God does not line up with the character and person of Jesus Christ, it's just got to. It's got to line up with Jesus. Philip comes to Jesus and says, shows us the Father. In John, it kind of recalls this. Jesus replies, and he says, I've been with you so long, and you still do not know me. Philip, you still don't know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I love this passage for two reasons. Uh, the first is just the honesty of Philip. Just show us the Father. He's just like us. We want to see God. We want to understand him. We want to know what is certain. What can I count on? What am I supposed to believe in? How am I, and what am I supposed to trust in? Don't we create a God in our head, again, often left over from our childhood that is just incorrect? But Jesus' response is quite simple and almost hard to believe. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's it. It's that simple. So how do we come to know Jesus? In these latter years of my life, the person of Jesus has become a, a singular focus of mine. I love the Old Testament. It does much to point us to the Christ. I love the writings of Paul and the apostles. They do their best to bring clarity to doctrine and to expand on the life and teachings of Jesus. But to me, the Gospels have become my home. It is a place where I encounter the resurrected Jesus. It is a place where I find a, a place to pray to talk to him about his life and his purpose here on earth. My encouragement to you this morning is to keep working on your relationship with Jesus. Get to know him the best that you can. Talk to him. He has promised that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Get to know Jesus and you will get to know the Father. So the Jesus I've come to know and trust told us a story that shows the heart of the Father, you know this story. It's a story of two brothers. It's one who took all of his inheritance and went to a foreign country. And when he had met his end, when he had no place to go but to go home, home he went. And Luke tells us, but while he was a still long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father felt compassion and ran to his son. This is not the drill sergeant God. This is not the chronically disappointed God. This is not the busy CEO God. You are beloved by God. Right here, right now, in this moment, you are beloved by God. So what does this father see in secret? If my image of God is one who is compassionate and runs to me, what does he see? What exactly does he see? I believe he sees you like no one else can. He sees you and you are beloved. God knows your desires. He knows this inner part of you that might even be a secret 
to yourself. He is closer to you than you are to yourself. This morning, I'm asking you to be open to the idea that there is an inner place within you. Call it your heart. Call it your soul. Call it your essence. However you think of this inner place, please know that God sees you, all of you, and He loves you very, very much. If we open up the secret place within us to God on a daily basis, then I believe He will reward us. If we talk to Him about our heart's desires, not the superficial ones, but the desires deep within us, if we will daily return to the Father in an honest state of ourselves, if we return home, then I believe the Father's tender heart will have compassion on us and will run to us. For our final segment of our time together, I want to kind of turn to a corporate practice. These last seven weeks, we've been spending time in Scripture meditation. We've taken about seven minutes of our morning just to hear from God through Scripture and the Holy Spirit. For the next seven weeks, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to pivot. Our goal is to create what we're calling a sacred space. It's going to be similar but yet different. In fact, each Sunday there's going to be a different practice. So, this is our first sacred space. What are we going to do? We are going to sit in silence for five minutes. I'm going to venture that this is something none of us have ever done in a worship service. I certainly have never done this. Isn't Sunday morning supposed to be about singing and praying out loud and sermons? I've come to believe that the best way of entering into this secret place where God sees is through silence. Now trust me, your mind and your heart and even your body are going to be very active during this five minutes. So what do you do when you sit in silence? Do you try to figure out what you're going to do for lunch? Do you think about that argument you had this morning? Maybe you make a list. Oh, here's a good thing. I'll make a list of all the things I'm grateful for. I can do that in silence. The answer is no. You do none of these. Or at least you try to do none of these. (laughs) But I'm going to give you something to do. I'm going to give you something to draw your attention to. I'm asking you to draw your attention to the love of God. I'm here to tell you that everyone in this room, there's no exception, your attention will be drawn elsewhere. It will be, and that's okay. It is a very, very human thing to do. It does not mean that you're a bad Christian. It means that you're a human being. You know what else might happen? You might fall asleep. You know what that says about you? It says you're tired. That's all. That's all it says. And maybe you need to rest. I'm asking you to be gentle with yourself over these next five minutes. It's not about doing it right. It's not about getting something out of it. Try to let go of all of that. Just remember, when your attention begins to wander, and it will, gently draw it back to the love of God. And that's it. That's all there is to it. I want to tell you a quick story, and I hope it's an illustration of what I'm what we're trying to set up for today. In 2012, my father died of dementia. Suffered with it for seven years. If you have a family member who's ever lived through that, you know what a horrible disease that is. My father's in Memphis. I'm in Tulsa. My mom's taking care of him. I would go back occasionally to see my dad. You know, in the early months or years, you could talk to him, kind of. It was tough. Uh, But you know how the disease progresses. It's just horrible. Eventually, obviously, my dad was gone. Didn't know who I was, didn't know who anybody was. But I would go to see him, and um, sometimes I would go, and I would just sit with him. I wouldn't talk to him. He wouldn't talk to me. He couldn't. Didn't even know who I was. But I would sit with him in silence. We'd just sit there. Now, why did I do that? What did I get out of it? I got everything because I was with my dad. I was just with him. 
I didn't expect anything out of him. He wasn't expecting anything out of me. But everything is part of me. And you have to understand, my dad had a really good dad. Really good dad. And so to be with him, that's all I needed. That's what I'm inviting you into this morning. Be with your heavenly father. Don't talk to him. Don't listen for what he has to tell with you. Just sit with him. Let's prepare by being quiet, our feet flat on the floor, and our eyes closed. I encourage you to take a couple of deep breaths in and out to settle yourself. Focus your attention on the love of God. Let's begin.